All right. So hi, everybody. Um, so first off, my apologies for running a little bit uh, late with everything this week. My kid got RSV and can't go to daycare, so I'm running slightly behind with everything. Um, as such, I will give you a little bit of extra time to finish the quizzes and assignments associated with the next two lectures. Um, so you won't have to have these done until the week after Thanksgiving. I'll post uh, more um, information in the uh, announcements uh, tab on Georgia View. But <clears throat> yeah, just know that I'm not going to be holding you uh, responsible for all of this um, immediately. OK, so we're going to start this week by talking a little bit about disability studies. So I asked you to read uh, Tobin Sieber's 2010 essay, The Aesthetics of Human Disqualification. So let's start by talking a little bit about what this idea of human disqualification is, where it comes from, and where our ideas of disability and how to talk about it and how to represent it culturally um, come from. So I want to start with a quick framing device. So in 2001, uh, the ethical philosopher Peter Singer and the disability rights advocate Harriet McBride Johnson um, <clears throat> debated one another um, over a principle that uh, Singer had published in an article. Um, Singer had, had argued that it was actually more moral and more ethical um, to abort a fetus that you knew was going to grow up to be severely disabled um, in order to reduce the amount of pain and suffering um, that that person would have to deal with um, over the course of their life, or that some, that if, if someone would not be able to live a fully, a fully human life as Singer imagined it, then it would be more kind, more merciful, more moral to never allow that person to be born. Ergo, they would never suffer. So McBride Johnson um, set herself up as a kind of living counterexample that you know this this you know to this idea that a person with a severe and painful disability um, is only a vessel for suffering um, and cannot live a fully human existence right uh, McBride Johnson was a lawyer uh, she was a civil rights activist um, uh, who you know lived who lived um, a very full and active life and you know, despite her severe disabilities um, and you know, the fact that she was confined for most of her uh, life to a motorized wheelchair. Um, so <clears throat> you know, she wanted it known that she did not see her life or her existence as um, somehow kind of like less than or truncated uh, because of her disability, and that she did not see herself uh, her, or her life as less than fully human. Um, and I think like, like this kind of gets at the heart of what the, dis the disability studies field is really about, is examining the limits of what and who we are willing to consider fully human. As McBride Johnson's uh, argument to Singer was that <clears throat> he was not, in fact, considering someone like her capable of living what he thought of as a fully human life. All right, so disability studies. What is it? Where does it come from? Um, so first off, it challenges the idea that there is or should be a normative human body or psyche. Um, it should be noted that not all disabilities are physical or visible, right? 
The disability studies uh, scholar argues that ability and disability are social constructs used to sort people into hierarchical categories. So we can see the influence here of Judith Butler's um, gender studies theory, right? You know, the idea of gender as social or performative categories um, that are socially constructed, created by society, right? Um, a disability studies scholar or advocate would argue that disability is a similar kind of thing. Um, and indeed, value judgments about the appearance of disabled people have often served the interest of political regimes with eugenic goals. Uh, we'll talk in a, in a minute about what eugenics and scientific racism are and how that relates to all of this. Um, and and they also detect a relationship between ability disability discourses and racial hierarchies, right? There is a, a, um, a hierarchy of ableism as well as um, kind of like racial and class hierarchies and gender hierarchies within a given society. Okay, so I mentioned eugenics on the last slide, right? For those of you who don't know what eugenics is, it's um, a series of 19th and 20th century movements that are influenced by evolutionary biology and by this uh, idea that we call scientific racism. So scientific racism is specifically the classification of human beings into hierarchies based on racial typologies, right? So You'll see, for example, in anthropology textbooks in the 19th century, um, classifications of various racial types. We'll have a, you know, a picture of, a, you know, say like a human face that is typical of a certain um, racial type. Um, for example, you know, like, you know the, um, they tend, particularly if they're produced in Northern Europe, they tend to rate Northern European, right, kind of this kind of Germanic, um, British, Nordic faces as belonging to the highest racial type, working their way down through, you know, Celtic uh, face types, Irish, Welsh, um, and Mediterranean face types, uh, you know, Italians, um, Southern French, all the way down eventually um, to African face types, which are typically on the bottom of the racial hierarchy pyramid. And what scientific racism was, was an attempt to prove empirically the intellectual and physical superiority of Northern Europeans. So eugenics grows out of that, right? Eugenics is this argument that human beings should breed selectively to encourage only the best qualities in the population, right? So, you know, qualities like intellect, uh, health, physical strength, aesthetic beauty, things of that nature, right? And that people who are, in particular, people who are mentally or physically inferior as judged by society should not be permitted to breed. So this particular, especially includes those who are disabled. This all feeds into a discourse referred to as ableism, right? So I can give you an example of ableism um, from the very building that I work in, right? So I don't think any of you have been around this campus long enough to remember a period of time when the English building did not have an elevator. But I was hired in 2012. And from the time I got here, it took us about a decade to get one. Um, so what this meant was that <clears throat> um, students who could not get to the upper floor where the main floor of the building is, or it couldn't, you know, couldn't meet in office hours with the professors, um, had to request uh, that we hold classes in the kind of inferior and neglected classrooms on the bottom floor. Um, which, you know, often had wasps in them, fun, and often could not participate in department activities because, you know, again, like the meetings would be held 
um, on the upper floor. So, you know, for about 10 years, we argued that, you know, this building required an elevator. And for about 10 years, the administration uh, put us off. And then finally, they built one, um, I believe, in 2021, um, you know, during, <laughs> during the pandemic, when we were still mostly online. Um, but I digress. So ableism is <laughs> discrimination against people with physical and or cognitive disabilities, whether conscious or unconscious. Um, an ableist assumes, you know, the physically able body or mind as normal, right? You know, it kind of takes this as what, you know, the, you know, the average. And so so th think about how Freud, right, tends to think of a, an educated middle class European male as a normal individual, right? The ableist does the same with... <clears throat> physical bodies, right? You know, a, a body that is not marked by disability. And so ableists organize society, ableism refers to the organization of society for the benefit and comfort of those who are regarded as physically or cognitively normal. So this often leads to representations of the disabled in literature um, and culture more broadly that emphasize their difference uh, from or exclusion from the norm. So they're all, they're often depicted as social others. So you've got you know characters like Tiny Tim in A Christmas Carol or Quasimodo in The Hunchback of Notre Dame, who are supposed to elicit uh, feelings of pity, right, of pathos in the audience. You've also got disabled characters who are depicted as um, villains or monsters. So two examples from Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, uh, Long John Silver, um, and the one-legged pirate who's the main villain of the piece, and Blind Pew, um, who comes to deliver the black mark to Billy Bones at the beginning of the narrative. Uh, Captain Hook in J.M. Barrie's Peter Pan right, is, also, you know, is also disabled. He's missing a hand. Right, so disability is often associated with villainy in some way. Um, you've also got disabled people who are depicted as kind of like these almost kind of incomplete personalities, right? So um, Captain Ahab in Herman Melville's Moby Dick um, is so fixated on the loss of his leg um, that he is consumed with this notion of vengeance against an animal, right? A creature that has no appreciation for or understanding of the fact that it has harmed a human being. Um, and he devotes all of his energy to pursuing and killing this whale in vengeance for its uh, kind of rendering him a kind of other, right? So in taking away his leg, it also kind of takes away much of his humanity. So the disabled character is often used to provoke pity, disgust, or curiosity in the reader um, through a process called infreaking, which is mentioned in the Siebert's essay, right? So infreaking is, the emphasis, is an emphasis on physical and cognitive difference in order to render an individual other or abnormal. So let's talk a little bit about um, the Siebers essay and like kind of run over some of the main points of it. Um, and then uh, we'll continue this on the discussion boards um, <clears throat> over the course of the next week and a half or so. So Tobin Siebers uh, was an American cultural scholar and disability advocate. Um, and so the essay I had you read for today is called The Aesthetics of Human Disqualification. Um, and his basic argument is about the use of cultural aesthetic norms to render people or cultures monstrous or somehow less than fully human, right? The idea of aesthetic beauty or aesthetic normalcy, at least, um, as 
criteria for deciding who is or is not a full human being, right? Who's accorded full human status. So Sievers argues that disability is often equated with racial, sexual, and class difference. So the example he gives us at the beginning is of um, a charity called Smile Train um, that you know goes around the world fixing, uh, you know, fixing or performing surgery on children. You know, I'm sorry, pardon me for using ableist language there. Um, performing surgery on children who have cleft palates. Um, to bring their appearances more in line with what is considered normal. Now, one thing that Siebers notes here is that in the advertisements intended um, to get people to donate to this charity, you typically have um, a <clears throat> white celebrity from somewhere from somewhere in the Anglosphere. of conventionally attractive appearance posing in front of pictures of young, usually poor um, children of color from various places um, in the global south. So what this does is encode in this idea of disability, right, not only that these children have um, a facial disfiguration um, that <clears throat> is supposed to render their lives um, abnormal or you know, unpleasant in some way, um, but also that this is a phenomenon that strikes poor children of color, right? So, the, so we're kind of infreaking these children in two ways, right? One, by focusing on the facial, uh, the facial abnormality, and two, um, by demonstrating that they belong to low, you know, low prestige social groups, right? So Siebers refers to disqualification as a symbolic process that removes individuals from the ranks of quality human beings, right? Not that it necessarily regards people who don't meet our aesthetic standards as not human, but that they're rendered a kind of different kind of human or, a, or less human than we are, if that makes sense. So these forms of disqualification include things like involuntary institutionalization, and compulsory sterilization, right? So separating people who are different from the rest of the population um, and or destroying their ability to procreate without their say-so, right? Without their acquiescence. And this is based on assumptions that any deviation from a culture's physical or cognitive norm equates to inferiority. And this definition of inferiority is naturalized amongst the population to justify the unequal treatment of people who don't meet um, the culture's aesthetic standard. We can probably we can see the Marxist influence here of, the, of ideology, right? So this idea of um, <clears throat> ability and, and like you know of ableism as an ideology, right? And when Sievers talks about aesthetics, he actually means something rather specific by this as well. Um, aesthetics for Sievers refers to the way that some bodies make other bodies feel. Note that he does not reference attractiveness or beauty here or whatever. He references feelings that arise in other bodies from the close experience of a particular body, right? That the disabled body, for reasons of this, this ableist ideology, provokes different feelings 
in someone who meets the culture standards or aspires to the culture standards um, than other bodies that are more similar to their own, right? And this leads, according to Sievers, to oppression, right? What he refers to as the systematic victimization of one group by another. So the group that we can, that fits the definition of able, oppressing the group that fits the definition, the de definition of disabled. And this is justified by assumptions of natural superiority over those who are regarded as cultural others. Okay, so I will post some questions about all of this on the discussion boards um, sometime tomorrow, tomorrow being Wednesday the 20th. Um, <clears throat> so um, watch this lecture, watch the eco-criticism lecture that will follow, and then that'll be it in terms of new material for this course, right? The, the remainder of the course will spend just try, trying to get you ready for the final exam and for um, the final paper. All right, so please do get in touch if you have any questions, um, and we'll see you on the discussion boards. Take care, everybody.